Thanks very much, Peter. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that the Marshall Institute uh, is uh, sponsoring this thing, and I'm glad to finally, after really a very long time, to have had the chance to actually meet and shake hands with Barry Blackman, having read his stuff uh, for, for quite a while, because somehow we never quite uh, came across each other. And so as a nation now, we're engaged uh, once again in a very large effort to try to modernize our strategic nuclear forces. Uh, we last did this in very different circumstances at, toward the end of the 1970s and early 1980s. We have a very different world now and a very different future now. But we've lived with nukes and we've wrestled with these issues for over half a century. And, you know, we think we might have learned a few things. So as we make decisions to create the nuclear force that will take us through the 2080s, do we know what we're doing? And I'm afraid my feeling is, ah, well, not so much. And let me try to lay that out a little bit and suggest some ways we might go ahead. All of our issues about nuclear forces, I think, at root, come down to two questions. Why do we have nuclear weapons, and what do we want to do with them? Well, we know the answer to the first one. I like, I like it uh, as formulated by Larry Welch, who said, you know, we've got them because we didn't want Hitler to be the only one who had them, <laughs> okay? I think that's an artful formulation. I think it continues to resonate, okay. But we don't know the answer to the second, what do we want to do with them? The aspiration is clear enough. We don't want to use them, and we don't want anyone else to use them either. But how do we get that to happen? Ah, that's where the fun starts. How do we do deterrence? Is it the sheer horror of these things, their power and their, and their long-lasting poisons, is that enough to forestall any intentional use? Can nations actually threaten suicide? Can they do that credibly? Does having more usable nuclear weapons increase or reduce stability? What do we need to know and what can we know about the views and the calculations about the decision making and the policy and program execution of foreign governments? And for that matter, what can be taken as certain about American views, calculations, decision makings and execution, particularly under the stress of a nuclear crisis? So what happens then is that we don't know answers to these things. We get lots of answers to them, but the usefulness of any particular answer depends on the circumstances at hand. I realize that everybody here has wrestled with these issues. I'm, I'm stating the obvious, but I just want to remind us again that who we want to deter, from what, in what circumstances, by what means, all those details matter. That means that deterrence is relational, it's situational, it's conditional, and it's mutable. Tailored deterrence is a redundancy. And the choice of force structures and postures to give the term some operational significance is really discretionary. It will depend on our judgment and our feelings. And so our nuclear doctrine remains fundamentally ambiguous, as it must. And with each successive modernization effort or proposed arms control treaty, we debate vigorously the same questions. And the debates often feature concepts that describe attractive aspirations, but offer very little systematic development. There's nothing new here. We've, we've seen it always before. It's just part of our dealing with the nuclear problems. Kissinger, for example, complained 40 years ago about slogans like superiority, parity, and assured destruction that had no operational military significance or definition, and certainly no consensus on their political implications. If he were writing today, he might complain about the recent 491 report, which talks about ensuring a strong and robust deterrent in pursuit of strategic stability, and so on. What do these things mean, and, and how do we actually get there? That's the problem. So these arguments show that we not only don't have a general theory of deterrence, we don't have a general consensus about, we don't have a about what we don't have a theory about. We don't really know what a war with nuclear weapons would be like. So we speculate and we build our programs accordingly. Now agreement on the speculations, whether mine or like yours, if you think it's credible and all this kind of stuff can wax and wane, but generally I think we found three uh, contending outlooks basically. One believes that nuclear weapons can be used in controlled and discriminating ways to defend the United States and its allies. And those people tend to advocate a war fighting, flexible response approach to deterrence. You know, that reminds me, I suppose, of Secretary Schlesinger's initiatives in nuclear targeting, for example, a countervailing strategy. Another view believes that any use of nuclear weapons, any use, would escalate uncontrollably, resulting in horrible damage to both sides. 
And so the only role for nuclear weapons is to deter the first use of nuclear weapons by an adversary. And those are the kinds of people, those, those, those are the views that sort of lead to recommendations about minimum deterrence and, and, and so on. And then there's a third view that we don't hear quite so much anymore, but it's still around, probably associated initially with John Foster Dulles, among others. And that is that it agrees that nuclear use would escalate uncontrollably, but it believes that the threat of using nuclear weapons would deter both nuclear and conventional attacks and would be much cheaper than building up conventional forces, and therefore we should maintain the threat of early use of nuclear weapons and get those benefits. Those different views will persist and will continue to have arguments then over our force modernization as long as we're trying to modernize forces or conduct strategic arms limitation agreements. Notwithstanding the continuing contentions there, though, by and large we had agreed, I think, that if a president did have to use these damn things, they had better well work. We certainly didn't want to, be, uh, to have a president be in a position of launching some demonstration strike against some future Hitler, to impress some future Hitler, and have the sucker turn out to be a dud. You know, at that point, <laughs> Katie bar the door in terms of the threats and demands that we'd be facing. But you know, today I'm concerned that there might be some uncertainty here as well, in addition to the uncertainties that we've just talked about. And that uncertainty might actually be growing because of the policies that we've adopted since the end of the Cold War. We have ruled out manufacturing any new warheads. The most recent we have was built in 1991. We have abandoned underground testing. The most recent test was in September of 1972. And we have required both presidential and congressional authorization for the remanufacturing of components and for work on new weapons designs. And unlike the uncertainties that I talked about at the outset, these about the warheads are largely self-imposed. And so I'd like to take a few minutes and sort of look at the problem. Increasingly, the weapons themselves are different from what the stockpile was in 1992. They're being modified through life extension programs, <coughs> LEPs, which replace the life-limited components of certain weapons and make other changes to correct or counteract or anticipate the effects of aging and to improve safety and security of the weapons. <clears throat> With no testing, then, confidence in the reliable effectiveness, safety, and security of the weapons rests on the opinions of experts. Those opinions are formed by various tests and analyses, which include disassembly of selected weapons, and by more detailed understanding of the physics of nuclear weapons, far more detailed, actually, than we ever had during the actual testing days. And so the result is, and I want to be sure to try to get this clear, that confidence in the reliable effectiveness of the weapons therefore turns on the assumption that today's better science can enable models and simulations that will reliably predict the performance of yesterday's weapons that are now configured in ways that were never explosively tested. Got a few steps in there, okay? But again, it's the assumption that today's better science will reliably predict the performance of the weapons we got. Those are yesterday's weapons. But they don't look like and they aren't configured as they were when they were actually being tested, okay? So that's the, that's the assumption that, that we depend on. Okay. Lots of people are very comfortable with that assumption. I can, I can list the reasons why, and I think it's worth listening to them. Uh, one is the demonstrably improved understanding of the physics involved, absolutely. Second, the development of very large high-speed computers running highly detailed simulations, far beyond what we could have imagined, even in 1990, okay? Very helpful. Uh, comfort is encouraged by the fact that the original configurations of the weapons in the stockpile were certified to be effective during the time when underground testing was conducted. They're not exactly the same, but they were configured. Our comfort is encouraged by the continuing recruitment of scientists, really good ones, to the stockpile programs. And of course, their job is to sort of look over the work that went before and try to find problems with it. Comfort is encouraged by the effort, at least so far, to replicate wherever possible the original materials and procedures when they have to replace or modify parts. Not always possible, but they try hard to do that. And finally, 
comfort with the assumption that that approach will tell us the truth is, is encouraged by the annual agreement among the leaders of scientific, technological, military, and political organizations, known as the annual certification process, to certify that the stockpile is safe, secure, reliable, and effective. That, that's, that's a big business, big set of activities that go on. And some members of Congress, in fact, in previous authorization reports, have expressed even more confidence in this approach than they had when we actually were doing weapons testing. Those are the people that are comfortable with the assumption. Other people are not comfortable with the assumption, okay? Let me talk about why they have problems. One is the lack of empirical data to validate the tools that are being used to assess and certify the stockpile. The second is that the effects of aging and the various life extension programs have changed the weapons in the stockpile somewhat from their original configurations, and at issue is whether those differences mean that test data from 20 plus years ago, the underground testing, can still validate the weapons in today's configurations. <coughs> Some of the scientists involved raised concerns as early as 1999 about actions that had been taken to change the design of the weapons in the stockpile and made the point that if there were no moratorium, those changes would already have called for nuclear tests to confirm the validity of the actions that had been taken. Another problem, specific non-critical tests of individual uh, modifications. I charged the tritium, okay, did that. I put in new arming, fusing, firing subsystems. I put in new surety features. I might have to use some new materials. I have to use a new me you know, me uh, me mechanical uh, processing device or something like that, okay. Specific non-critical tests of each of those things separately, you know, cannot address the possibility of interactions among them or what gets called in the business the indeterminacy question, okay. These things may link up in ways that we didn't think about, and we all have examples of this in mind. We know about bridges that collapsed or engines that blew up or airplanes that fell out of the sky because of some interaction effect that we hadn't really counted on. In the space business, we really know that, that as, a, as being a problem. We don't know the extent to which indeterminacy affects the performance of nuclear weapons. Another problem is that testing may be required in the future, even if it's not required today. Now, there's an oft-quoted finding from the Jason's report, the, the famous science group and so on. There's an oft-quoted finding that said that the life extension programs could extend confidence in today's nuclear warheads for decades. What's not quoted so often is that the Jason's conditioned or put assumptions or qualifications around that statement. Uh, saying that they, they, they needed to have people pay attention to their warnings that future success is threatened by lack of program stability, placing any life extension program in the future at risk, and that the program required implementation of a massively, re of a revised uh, surveillance program. And finally, the directors of Los Alamos, of Liver Lawrence Livermore and Sandia all agreed that it can't be assumed that with increasing insight and increasing understanding that will necessarily increase confidence in the actual performance of the stockpile. That kind of knowledge is fundamentally unknowable in advance. You're going to have to do something. And that's why I, I suspect that John Deutsch uh, was writing in Foreign Affairs, what, two years ago, I guess, and he simply pointed out that at some time we are going to have to do a test just to validate the science, to, to, to know what the links are between the tests that we're doing and, and the actual performance. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so all of that is why I'm thinking we may not have the great answers that we might have thought we had to what we need to be able to do in the future. We keep these maybes and uncertainties in mind and the question is, you know, what nuclear forces do you think you're going to want in 20 plus years? And I'm not here to sell you on a particular number of submarines or a type of aircraft or any of that kind of stuff, but I do want to talk about some options and I'll make that very quick. Let's start with the bigger guys, because both Russia and China have got ongoing nuclear force modernization programs. There seems to be a general agreement in the U.S. that neither Russia nor China should be allowed to acquire a substantial or perceived nuclear force advantage. The planned modernization of our triad is originally outlined in the 1251 report with the, the new submarines, the new uh, land-based ICBMs, the new bomber, and then associated weaponry for that. Is it linked, is intended to accomplish that goal, but it's going to take almost 20 years for those forces to be out there. 
during that time, we might come to prefer a different approach because there'd be changes in the composition, the size, and the posture of future Russian forces. There might be new targets whose hardness or configuration would be challenging. The arms control agreements might constrain the number of weapons or other things in different ways. The Russians', Russians own strategic views and assessments might change significantly, prompting changes in how we would try to influence them or deter them, and, uh, and so on. And consequently, if we could approach this in a more incremental, time-phased way that would have decision nodes with developmental options in the future, that, that would be an attractive alternative to locking us into this massive investment and, and the, the, the relative inflexibility of those things for the next you know, half century or so. Now, th that isn't just me talking. I think the Air Force has something like that in mind. You know, the new penetrating bomber that they're talking about will be initially conventional, later nuclear, and probably initially human uh, piloted, and later uh, perhaps uh, with, uh, with uh, no human pilot. Uh, Perhaps they could do it the same with ICBMs. I mean, take a look at the at the energy in the uh, GBIs for the for the missile defense program. They'll fit inside the Minuteman silos, but they're also built to be delivered by trailers and so on. That might give us a mobi mobility option if it would turn out that we would need that at some time in the future. Um, a common missile for submarines and for land-based ICBMs might be a good idea from that point of view. Technically, enormously challenging. Got it? Okay. But it would really help to rebalance the force in response to whatever threat we saw coming up in, say, 25 years or something, if, if we could do that. Um, the Navy, I think, plans an incremental approach because they want to buy the submarines first, the Ohio-class replacement, and then get the new Trident uh, missiles uh, to go with it and so on. Now, the problem is that the cost of the subs, of course, is enormous, and that's been discussed extensively. I won't spend any more time on it except to say I sure hope we could find an alternative to getting at least some of the new subs out and then seeing what happened without having to go, uh, at least initially, to the whole hog. And then finally, we would want to be able to extend that flexibility in development to operational matters as well. That will require a very, very big effort in new nuclear C cubed uh, in order to provide that flexibility for a future president. With regard to the other guys, the non-big ones, do we really think we'll actually use nuclear weapons? We haven't. I mean, yes, we did in World War II. Please, that's a whole separate issue. Okay, since then we haven't. We've been attacked many times. We haven't used them. We might, of course. Can't, can't say that we won't. You know, if we got hit, if our forces got hit by a nuclear attack by North Korea or whatever it is, but, you know, if we would use a nuclear weapon from a military point of view, I'm not sure that's the answer we'd come out with. And the reason is that they really bugger up the battlefield. And they present, you know, really challenging difficulties in terms of thinking about war termination and, re, you know, restore, excuse me, restoration of the peace and, and, and on and on, those kinds of things. I, I, I remember serving as president in a war game down at the Maxwell uh, School. And the guys came in because, uh, you know, somebody had done something to our space things, and they said, ah, give us permission to nuke them. And I said, sure, as soon as you show me the battlefield advantage, I'll sign off, no problem. I had a mutiny on my hands. <laughs> but, but we didn't use them. That's it. So, so, you know, there, there are sort of military analysis required. So um, what I think instead would be really important would be for us to have the option to deal militarily with lesser nuclear powers without us using nuclear weapons, even if the other guys did. So I'm talking about general purpose forces that can operate in nuclear and post-nuclear environments. Secretary Aspen recognized this as a desirable goal in 1993. He pointed out that nuclear weapons can be an equalizer against superior conventional forces and that today the United States would be the equalizee. Uh, we haven't been able to keep up with that. The uh, Mim John and others on the Defense Science Board have been complaining about this for, I don't know, at least 10 years. Uh, but it seems to me quite reasonable that we should try to develop a general purpose forces capability to operate in nuclear environments. One more thing, that recognition also prompted Secretary Aspen and President Clinton to conclude that non-proliferation, a very important U.S. goal, needed to be reinforced and that was that the United States needed to be able to roll back proliferation once it had occurred. Aspen thus urged the creation of counter-proliferation capabilities, a, a term that you'll still find today in some programs, but it doesn't mean what he was talking about. It's gotten 
smooshed in with non-proliferation. He's talking really about a program that would allow us to go and do things and take nuclear devices or nuclear efforts away from uh, proliferance. Okay. These uncertainties that I mentioned here, conceptual, analytical, operational, empirical, will play out in a strategic future that is itself deeply uncertain, if only because of the number and variety of actors and the non, both uh, state and non-state with which we have to contend. In the meantime, our posture, the U.S. nuclear posture, reflects a doctrine of unresolved ambiguities, as it must, and consists of nuclear warheads untested for two decades that would be delivered, at least for the next decade plus, by weapons built during the Cold War in greatly reduced numbers as determined by agreement with Russia. How well does that posture match the weapons to the times? Well, that's up to you. We'll be, uh, but we do need to be taking timely action, and we also need to preserve options for a highly dynamic, uncertain future. Thank you.